Thanksgiving week. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you and to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, and Professor and former President Munsef Marzouki uh, to Washington. He has been a uh, visiting senior fellow at the Harvard School of Government uh, in Cambridge. And it's uh, really a pleasure to welcome him uh, today uh, to this event. Uh, really, uh, former President Marzouki does not need an introduction for those of you who know Tunisia and who have been following uh, Tunisia closely. But um, we also have viewers on C-SPAN today and also on Zoom uh, who might not know Tunisia very well. So I'm going to take a few minutes to introduce uh, Dr. Marzouki. He has been one of the most prominent uh, uh, fighters and advocates for democracy and human rights, not only in Tunisia, but in the entire Arab world for the last 50 years. Um, he was a founder of the Tunisian Human Rights League in the 70s, I think, in 71, 72, something like that. One of, 70, uh, one of the founders. And uh, he became president of the Tunisian Human Rights League. He has been active since then for 50 years on uh, defending human rights in Tunisia and across the MENA region. Uh, he uh, was a, uh, uh, the founder and the president of the uh, Congress for the Republic Party, one of the main parties in Tunisia uh, before the revolution, who fought against Ben Ali regime for uh, over a decade or, or uh, you know, maybe 15 years or so. And then after the, um, the Arab Spring or the revolution of 2011, uh, Professor Marzouki was elected as the first democratically elected president of Tunisia and he served as president between 2012, uh, from 2012 until 2014. So for three years, he was the president of Tunisia, three very difficult years, because those are the first years of the democratic transition in which Tunisia um, worked very hard to come together and to write the first constitution, the first democratic constitution in Tunisia and, and in the Arab world. Um, he, um, he led a coalition of the first of its kind, the first of its kind in the Arab world between Islamic parties and secular parties. It was a really uh, a novel idea to have secular parties and Islamic or religious based parties uh, such as Nahda working together for the uh, success of the democratic transition in Tunisia. And for three years he was part of this coalition and he was the president uh, of the country. And really uh, it was uh, the, the three, country, three years that were um, uh, great in, in terms of achieving the democratic aspirations of the, of the revolution and the democratic aspirations of the Tunisian people. But of course you know that after that things started to deteriorate until we had, uh, you know, economically speaking especially, the economy did not really uh, take off. Um, the, there was no significant improvement in the economy. Uh, and then we had the pandemic in 2019 until, uh, to, uh, until last year basically, which really uh, were very painful on, on, the, on the Tunisian uh, democracy and the Tunisian economy. And that's when the coup happened in July of two, uh, 25 of July 2021. Uh, elected President Qais Saeed took the opportunity to basically uh, destroy the democratic transition, to close down the parliament, the elected parliament, to suspend the constitution, and uh, he claimed in the beginning that it was just corrective measures and temporary measures that, that the parliament would reopen in a month or two. Uh, he said in his first speeches, just, you know, it will be a month or maybe two months. But of course, we know that was, not, that was a lie. And uh, still the parliament is still closed until today. In fact, the majority of the members of parliament are being pursued in, uh, and tried because they met last March uh, virtually and they declared that all the, the decisions of, Qa of Qais Saeed are unconstitutional and therefore uh, illegal and, and unlawful. So after that, about 120, everyone who attended 
that uh, 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 meeting uh, online uh, was accused of treason because they declared that his actions were uh, illegal and unconstitutional. Uh, anyway, Professor Marzouki was one of the first people after the coup to oppose the coup and to take a very clear stand, very uh, principled stand against the coup. And he said, this is illegal, this is unacceptable. And um, he, he spoke up against the coup very strongly, very firmly. Uh, I have tremendous respect for Professor Marzouki, for former President Marzouki, because he's a man of principle and he always stood on his principles and never deviated from his principles, no matter what the cost is. Whatever, whatever his principles tell him to do, that's where Professor Marzouki and Dr. Marzouki and former President Marzouki will always be, on the side of democracy, on the side of human rights, on the side of freedom uh, for Tunisia and for the entire Arab region. So it's a pleasure to welcome him uh, on behalf of CSID and the uh, Washington Center for Yemeni Studies. Uh, we are organizing this meeting and we have about 100 people joining us on Zoom. Uh, so uh, we'll be happy to take questions uh, after uh, Professor Marzouki speak. I'd like to give the uh, opportunity to a representative from the Yemeni Center to uh, say a few uh, welcoming words. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Peace be upon you all. And in the light of the World Cup, hala bikum irhubu. We would like to congratulate our neighbors in Saudi Arabia for their, what, you know, the news lines and the headlines are calling a major upset for winning against Argentina to one. And we would like to wish the best of luck to Nusur Qartaj, the Eagles of Carthage, who will be facing Denmark in a few hours. They're playing right now, actually. Better luck next time. So uh, I would like to welcome all of you on behalf of the Washington Center for Yemeni Studies and our president, Mr. Abdul Samad al-Faqih, who is sitting in the back. Uh, the Washington Center for Yemeni Studies is a DC-based research, research organization who sheds light, a wider and brighter light, on the conflict of Yemen and aims to break down the complexities of the different, the humanitarian crisis, the ongoing war, and the different social issues in Yemen by marrying data with decision making. We provide simpler form. We break it down to the decision makers who have taken at times very active roles when it comes to Yemen, but unfortunately have at times come from very misinformed, well-intentioned uh, positions so that we aim to fix that. Uh, so I come from Yemen, contrary to common belief and redundant media headlines. I come from one of the richest countries in the Middle East. Uh, the jewel of Arabia, Arabia Felix, Al Yemen Al Saeed, from a land rich in history, in heritage, language, and culture. And as an avid reader of history, uh, the former president of Tunisia, Mustafa Al Marzouki, will tell you as much. And it is very refreshing for somebody who participated in the Arab Spring, a youth, to say, former president. We don't hear that as much, and we don't get to see that often, so I'll keep saying it and keep repeating it throughout. Um, so we are, besides that, we are also rich in natural resources, and we suffer from the resource curse in a very important geostrategic location that is unfortunately being held by a government that lacks sovereignty over the use of violence within its divine borders, which does more harm than good. Um, as a participant in the Arab Youth Revolution in 2011 that took down a dictator who ruled for 33 years, Ali Abdullah Saleh, we had one of the most successful revolutions in the Arab Spring. We are a population that was at the time 25 million. Now, ironically, despite the war, we're at 30 million. Our population increased despite the war. And we had the same president for 33 years. Um, second to the United States, we are the highest gun per capita holders in the world. <laughs> Every household has some kind of arms. More than the US? We're, we're the second exactly. guns per capita after the United States, <laughs> and we still decided to go the peaceful route. 
even after the Friday of Dignity, Jum'at al karama when uh, the President Saleh unleashed his forces and killed 53 uh, innocent, unarmed civilians, we still called out in the streets, Salmiya, Salmiya. After an attempted assassination of the President um, through the GCC initiative, he handed his power to his former Vice President, Abdurrabbu Mansour Hadi, who was supposed to be in for a transitional period of two years, and then we would hold elections. We also had an exemplary event known as the National... I, I always freeze when I, when I translate it, because I, I tried to translate it from Arabic. I think in Arabic and tra translate it to English. Um, Al-Hawar al-Watani, Al-Hawar al-Watani. The National Dialogue Conference. I apologize. The National Dialogue Conference where we brought representatives of all the Yemeni factions. We addressed the major discrepancies in all the, uh, all the issues that we had, giving from, starting from the separatist issue with the war that ensued in 1994, to the Houthis insurgents and their grievances against the Saleh regime. The Saleh regime then, while the National Dialogue was ongoing, allied himself with the Houthi rebel group who ironically had six insurgency wars against his regime between 2004 and 2010. Ali Abdullah Saleh is somebody who likened ruling Yemen to dancing and the heads of snakes. And he did that very masterfully until December 2nd, 2017, when his former enemies, now allies, the Houthis, he came out in December 2nd saying, I would like to open a new chapter with Saudi Arabia and the Saudi-led coalition, and we could unite, unify ourselves against the Houthis. He made these remarks and these statements from Sana'a, from their stronghold. Two days later, on December 4th, he was assassinated by none other than his you know, former enemies and now allies. In between that, what happened in 2015 is that the Houthi group uh, put the president and his cabinet under house arrest and he fled to Saudi Arabia and he called for the Saudi-led coalition to intervene and to restore him into power. And we have seen, a, unfortunately, a disastrous and un, not very well-planned intervention in Yemen that has led us to where we are today. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of uh, Marzouki's work and I follow his, uh, especially his breakdown of the levels of struggles. He breaks it down to three periods of time in history. The struggle against slavery. The second is the struggle against colonialism. And now the individual, the struggle for individual liberties within the states. And we know that every action has a counter reaction. And every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And no revolution has ever, has ever been saved or spared from a counter-revolution, which is what we're suffering from. But the, the fight is ongoing, and I would like, uh, I always use the uh, book, The Middle East Crisis Factory by Iyad al-Baghdadi and Ahmed Ghantash, who basically put in the frame of 30 years. For, they set a period of time for the Arab Spring to materialize within 30 years, and we are still in the epitome. Of the, and it's still going, it's only gonna get better from here. And we saw that with November 11th, there was a potential revolution in Egypt that everybody was looking forward to. But even though that did not materialize on the ground, it definitely broke the barrier of fear that was the main obstacle. And Mr. Marzouki will dive deeper into it, and we will look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. I know that it's not, probably not the most appropriate time for, for somebody to come to Washington, but uh, this is what, uh, what was decided by my friend. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Radwan. Uh, uh, thank you to the uh, Yemeni friends. And thank you, for all of us, to be here. Uh, I know you know a lot about what's happening in Tunisia and in the Arab world, so I will be as brief as possible so we can have a discussion because fortunately we are a small group so we can have a discussion and I really am interested in knowing exactly what's your opinion, what's your what's, uh, reflection. I, much, I am very interested in sharing our common thoughts more than uh, giving you my uh, narrative because 
I think a lot of you know exactly what is my narrative. So for a political actor, because I am still a political actor, I am still involved in politics, I am still fighting for, uh, for a democratic state in Tunisia. Uh, I'm in this field for more than five decades, imagine, but I'm still decided you know, to go on and uh, to never give up, even if we have had this black slide in uh, the last 10 years. The battle for freedom, for having a, a, a you know, democratic state is a matter of generation. It's not a matter of, you know, it's, it takes generation and generation. It's my honor to be just a link, you know, between the fight for, of my father and our father and grandfather, you know, against colonialism and to be this, the link, you know, to the, the fight is still going on and be sure that I'm not going to, to give up. So. For a uh, political actor, three questions for the, the moment now. For the moment, three uh, questions. What to fear, what to expect, and what to do. What to fear, what to expect, what to do. To respond to this question, we, we, we must have a clear idea about what happened and why did it fail, fail, you know, why did it fail? Because if you don't have a clear opinion, image or a framework of what happened and why it felt, I think we cannot respond to the question what to fear, what to expect, and what to do. Let me give you the five points of my narrative, the way of I see what happened and why did it fail, because it failed, yes, sure, but uh, I always say that the Arab Spring is in the beginning of the beginning of the beginning. So it's, it's not accurate to, take, to, to, to talk about failure if we are just in the beginning of the process. Five points, you know, to res resume my, uh, my narrative. First, our people, the Arab people, mainly in Yemen, in Syria, and in Libya, and also in Tunisia and in, uh, uh, in Egypt, we, we are victims of what I call the double crime the double crime of the, the ruling elites. Our people are once again victims of a double crime committed by this ruling elite. The first crime is that because of their incompetence economically, because of their corruption morally, because of the repression politically, they have pushed our people to revolt. It's the, the, the revolution is the main responsibility of, the, the, uh, of this uh, ruling elite. So this is where the first crime, pushing the people because they have refused everything, every kind of reform, they have pushed the people, to the, uh, our people, to revolt. The second crime is that they have organized everything, you know, to block, to, 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 to sabotage what was, and I hope still be, still a, a, a peaceful and democratic revolution. They had done everything. This is why I'm uh, talking about the crime. Look what the situation in Yemen. Look at the situation in Syria, look at the situation in Libya, look at the situation everywhere. It is a crime because we, you have uh, millions of refugees, uh, millions of Syrian refugees, millions of people starving in Yemen, mi mi millions of people, you know. This is why I don't like, you know, the image of Arab Spring. For me, it's completely ridiculous to talk about Arab Spring because when you think Spring, once again, you think uh, beautiful times and uh, beautiful birds singing, etc. While, in fact, it was what happened to our people is a real catastrophe. And this catastrophe, I think, once again, is the responsibility of this ruling elite because they, once they pushed our people to the bush and then they done everything, every crime, you know, to stop it. So we have been victims of our elite, our political elite. Second point is uh, we are victim also I don't like very much the concept of victim because it's a, it's a battle, you know, it's a, it's a fight. So, but I would put victims and uh, I can say that we have been victims once again of the, the most brutal and the most uh, uh, corrupt dictatorship in the region. The Saudi, the Emiratis, the Iranian, they have done everything in order to intervene in our this is why I don't think that um, democracy is no longer a domestic issue. Democracy, the 
promoting democracy everywhere now is a, re a regional and international issue. And this is, I think, we didn't realize in Tunisia in the beginning of the revolution that that we, we will be uh, in the, you know, in the center of uh, something we, we couldn't expect, we couldn't imagine. I have always said that Tunisia is, because it's a small country, because Tunisia is uh, uh, far from the uh, uh, Middle East, because we don't have uh, oil, etc., etc., we are going to, 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 to have our, uh, to mind our own business and nobody would be interested in us. In fact, it was a complete error because I was surprised to, to, to see that the wave of the Tunisian revolution reaching Libya, Egypt, and Angola, etc., etc. So, because, because the, the Tunisian revolution was uh, you know, threat, a serious threat to a lot of political regime. I think we have been victims of the intervention of this dictatorship and they destroyed our country. Libya, Syria, and Yemen have destroyed, totally destroyed by the foreign intervention. So talking about the fact that, so, oh, Arab Spring has failed because Arabs are not worth of democracy, etc. Bullshit, it's not that. It's, it, it, it's because mainly of the intervention of this uh, dictatorship. And here I come to the, uh, the external factor to say that, unfortunately, we saw that the dictatorship did everything to sabotage the, you know, the, the democratization process. Unfortunately, this is what I'm repeating all the time, unfortunately, we saw that the democracy, the Western democracy, did almost nothing in order to support us. And this is also to we have to take this and to remember this when we, would, we try to respond to the question what to do. So first we have been victims of the elite, the so-called elite. We have been victims of uh, the intervention of the dictatorship because where they are afraid of the Tunisian revolution, afraid of the, what, could happen, what could be the connotation. And I think they are right. Look what's happening in Iran now. What's happening in Iran is exactly is, you know, the continuation of the wave uh, uh, started. Tunisia 10 years ago, 11 years ago. But uh, let me uh, add some uh, point, an important point to the, the fact that the Western democracy didn't support our revolution. I think they are going to pay the high price for, for, for this mistake because it's, it's not only a moral mistake but also a political mistake. Because what's happened, if you have uh, uh, the situation if the situation would, uh, you know, would uh, worsen day after day, you will have more and more instability, political instability, more and more repression, more, etc. Well, this means that we would have a flow of refugees going to Europe, flow of refugees going to the United States, etc. And this will be probably the most important factor to strengthen the far right in Europe. This is why uh, in Europe now you have the comeback of the far right in Italy, in Sweden, in, uh, uh, in, in Denmark, in, uh, let, uh, of course in Poland and uh, in, uh, in Hungary. And you, you know that the far right is anti-democratic everywhere. So because they are not, because the Western democracy are not helping us, you know, to promote our democracy, maybe they are also undermining their own democracy. And th this has to be, th I think you have, we, here in the United States, you have to remind the political actor that, look, because you are not, the democracy is now a fight everywhere, and it's not an international, regional international fight. So if democracy is defeated in the Arab world, it will be defeated here. This is probably the most important lesson, uh, I think, that sh should be drawn from uh, what happened in, in, in this our region. And the second, uh, beside the, the external factor, the Arab Spring also failed because of internal factors. Yes, of course, mainly the division, the division between Islamists and, uh, and secularists. And I'm afraid this divide between secularists and Islamists is not known. I, I've tried my best during 10 years to bridge the, this gap between Islamists and, and, uh, and secularists, but I'm afraid that it didn't work, and I'm afraid that this bridge is not going to, it's, it's broken now, it's broken and I'm afraid that the gap would, would be larger and larger and I'm afraid, and I, I can say, I'll be frank with you, because of the mistakes by, made by the Islamist party, mainly in other in Tunisia, you know, accepting to deal with the counter revolution, there is no more faith, there is no more, um, I, I, 
I think that there is something broken between the Islamists and the, the secularists like me, and this would probably be one of the reasons that the process would be much more difficult than, than before. And then I will end with uh, the fact that, okay, uh, we have lost the battle, the counter-revolution has, uh, has won, but now the situation is very, very, um, I wouldn't say very ridiculous because Yes, the, 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 the revolution failed, but also the counter-revolution failed also. When you look at the situation in Egypt, when you look at the situation in Tunisia, you see that, the, of, of course, the counter-revolution has done everything, you know, so that uh, so, they, so we don't succeed. And they succeeded in making us not succeed. But the counterpart, you have the total failure, the total bankruptcy of the counter-revolution. Look at the situation in Tunisia, look at the situation in Egypt. I'm not talking about the situation in, in Yemen and in Syria and Libya because it's, it's caricature of a failure. It's something t t t terrible. But, and what's, what makes me a little bit optimistic is the fact that for the people now, for the Tunisian people, they saw uh, the two kinds of alternative uh, to, to, to democracy. In Egypt, the alternative to democracy, because uh, it, it was the alternative, is the uh, 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 dictatorship, uh, a harsh dictatorship, much more corrupt and much more violent than the dictatorship before the revolution. So they, they, the Egyptian people now is, are uh, watching what it means exactly to lose uh, uh, to lose a revolution uh, a transition. And in Tunisia, Tunisian people are watching every day what does it mean to have a populist regime? Because, you know, the, the alternative to democracy in Tunisia was populism, and the, uh, the alternative to democracy in Egypt was a, a, a dictator, harsher dictatorship than before. So this is, this is situation, uh, the situation now. What to fear? Uh, you know, uh, in 2000, uh, 11, 2010, nobody was expecting what's going to happen in Tunisia. I remember that in 2006, I went on Al Jazeera program and I addressed it to the Tunisian people, telling the Tunisian people, now it's, it's time to take, to take to the street. It's time, you know, to, you know, to get rid of this corrupt dictatorship, etc. And decided that at the time I decided to go back to Tunisia because I, I, I said I cannot appeal to the P Tunisian people to take the streets while I'm in Paris. So I decided to go back. I wanted to Tunisia in 2006. Nobody moved. Nobody, you know, uh, nothing happened. And uh, uh, I was obliged to leave once again Tunisia. And I thought at that time, maybe I'm not going to see any kind of revolution on my lifetime. In fact, five years, four, four or five years after, then you have the, the, the volcano, the, the eruption of the volcano. Uh, last week, last week, 11-11, the, the Egyptian revolution called the Egyptian people to take to the street. And I joined this appeal. I went on television network saying, hey, you, Egyptian people, Tunisian people, take to the street, it's time to get rid, etc. Et Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Nobody took to the street. And I understood that, in fact, you cannot, you, you know, it's, I told you that I don't like the image of Arab Spring. I prefer also to use the image of volcano, Arab volcanoes. Uh, and you know that the Arab vol volcano, you never, you never know when the volcano would erupt. You just know that it would erupt, but you never know. And this is exactly what the, the volcano ha, have their own time, uh, 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 own rhythm, all time. You cannot order to a volcano, hey, volcano, could you please explode? He wouldn't listen to you. You have, he listened, it's own regime, it's own, yeah, and it's it own uh, pressure, etc. So what I am sure of is that we are going to have a new explosion. This is what I fear. When, I don't know. Nobody, nobody know. Uh, what I fear most also that the, the next, uh, explosion would be much more violent than in the beginning of the, 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 the so-called Arab Spring because sure that we uh, uh, in Tunisia for instance we just have 300 people dead killed just 2,000 people wounded 
when we compare to the, 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 pri the price paid by the Yemeni, the Syrian, and the Libyan, it's nothing. But of course, it was something. But I'm afraid that the next um, outburst, the next explosion of the volcanoes, the price would be higher and higher and higher everywhere. Why? Because now there is a lot of hatred and frustration among the population, among the youth, you know, because they, they saw that the, they didn't get anything from the first revolution, and they are complaining that people like me and like Baranusha, and they, we have tried, you know, to be um, to reach this kind of consensus of the, all, all the regime, you know, to talk about transition and justice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for the new generation, I, I'm afraid that they, you, you forget about this, forget about all this. Those people, you know, are criminals. They, uh, they pushed us to revolution. They did everything, you know, to stop us. They are, look what they, we are going to get rid of them. I'm afraid there is so much hatred now in the youth that I'm afraid that really we, we are going to have both. And the other side, and the other side, the, the, the counter-revolution, they know that they are hated. They know that uh, they have a lot of blood on their hands. And I'm sure that they are extremely scared, they're extremely afraid, and they would do everything, you know, to stop uh, any kind of revolution. This is exactly what's happening in Egypt, you know. So what I fear most is that probably we can have a burst of violence, and this would be t terrible because I'm afraid that Tunisia or Egypt could, have, could uh, take the example, would have exactly the same fate that uh, Yemen or uh, or Libya, and I see any kind of, uh, of solution uh, in Yemen or, uh, or uh, in Syria. Now, I, I kept to the, the other point, what to do. What, this is what, what, what I fear most, uh, what to do. Uh, normally, when you are a wise man or a wise person, you would say, I must avoid this kind of fate we are fed up violence. We, we are, this, the, the economic situation is worsening. The politi political situation is worsening. We, we are threatening by the climate change. You probably know that our region is much, it's really the region that is endangered by the, uh, uh, by the climate change. So normally we would say we are, the, we are really under, uh, uh, it would be a question of survival. So we had to, to to reach a consensus, let's talk with the government, let's talk with the people now in, in, in charge to avoid this kind of uh, the, the fight. But can you imagine a CC talking to Ayman Noor? Can you imagine Qais uh, Saeed talking with me? I don't think so. Re unfortunately, I don't think so. I, those people, you know, are extremely scared. They are in their own narrative, in own ideology, and uh, I'm afraid that there is no way uh, to have this would, would be the, the, the best solution is to, to, to discuss, uh, to, to find a kind of a consensus about peaceful transition. About, but I'm not, well, I'm convinced that it would never happen. So what else? What should be done? Could, for instance, the government here in the United States, in Europe, put a lot of pressure on, uh, because the, the dictatorship are the client of the states put the pressure on them, you know. For instance, for the IMF loan, okay, we are going to give you the money, you know, to get rid of, uh, to solve some of your pro problems, but you have, you know, to make some concessions, some political concession. I'm not sure that also will be done. Look what's happening, what, what's happening. Uh, the two dictators are invited here in Washington in, uh, in December for the African-American summit. And uh, you remember that weeks ago we have had the summit of the Francophonie in uh, in, uh, in Jerba, and uh, no problem, you know, the, uh, two days, days ago, and no problem. The, the dem democratic leader of Canada, the democratic leader of France, the democratic leader of, of the country, you know, they went no problem, you know, to support the dicta dictator that have closed the parliament, that put jailing, that is jailing a lot of uh, journalists, etc. No problem. So, once again here, I'm not sure that it, it would work. I, it would be business as usual. Uh, the Western government has always supported the dictatorship and they will never stop doing this. They have their reason and we have to accept it. So, uh, this is why I'm telling to my friend uh, that we have to rely on ourselves and nothing else. Of course, we must do everything we can. We must try, we must try, but I don't think that 
something would, important would, would change. So what to do is, once again, to rely on ourselves, to resume the fight. To resume the fight mainly it's you know, to, to try to, and this is what I am working for, and we are a lot of people working for, you know, every first to have, uh, to consolidate a kind of uh, a democratic network within every state. And this is what we're working for in, in Tunisia. And uh, because I had the Arab Council for, uh, for the Democratic Revolution, we are also trying to build a network of democratic leaders of the, um, every, uh, of the, the as many country, uh, Arab countries possible, because we do know that we have to support ourselves. Because otherwise, we, we, you know, if we face every, uh, every democratic movement facing its uh, dictatorship, uh, without a link with the other fighters in the other worlds, in the other, uh, other parts of the world, Arab world, it's, it's, um, it's not a good solution because the, we are fighting a common enemy and the common enemy, they are working together. I, I can assure you that the, the dictatorship are working together, are linking our, the, all their efforts, you know, to stop this wave of democratization. I think I'm going to stop here because I would like to have your, uh, your opinion and also your uh, insight and maybe your uh, help me to, 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 to know what, what to do because it's really a matter extremely complex, extremely difficult. Uh, I don't have a receipt. I don't know if somebody has a receipt. But all what I can assure you that we are going to fight. We're going to, we never forget, give up. And we, yes, we have a lot of reason to be pessimistic, but we have also a lot of reason to be optimistic. The reason to be optimistic, once again, is the fact that we have a new generation, what I call the E generation, and this E generation uh, is committed to new values. And this new generation will never accept to be ruled as their grand grandfather was ruled by the, the regime of oppression of one man, one tribe, one group, etc. Having for them the, the wealth, having the consideration, having for them the power, and leaving the, the rest of the population, you know, in the, the, the misery you, you, you do know. So uh, we are going to, fa to, to fight. We are going to. Uh, the process is still uh, going on. We have lost the, the, the battle, but I always say that uh, uh, we are going to, uh, to win the war. Uh, you, you have talked about uh, the main idea. I repeat everywhere to the people who are a little bit discouraged, a little bit, you know, uh, they are tired very early. I always say, look, it took 3,000 uh, 3, years to get rid of slavery. It took 400 years to get rid of colonialism. It will probably take many, many, many decades to get rid of dictatorship, but be sure that we got rid of, of slavery, we got rid of, uh, you know, colonies, we are going to get rid of, of, the, uh, of dictatorship. I repeat this because it's very, I would say, very, not very funny, but I'm surprised that to see young people, you know, defeated very, very, very soon because we have lost the battle, saying, oh, the art spring is over, we have nothing to, 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 to hope, etc., etc. So this is why I'm trying to, to let them think. Think, um, consider the long term, not only the, the very, very short term. A decade is nothing in the history of a nation. It's nothing. It's just, you know, like, like this. Tunisia is 3,000 years old. So 10 years is nothing. It's just a, a moment. This is why. I repeat and I repeat, I repeat to the people, stick to our values, stick to our hope, and we will win. And my, uh, my slogan is, we have just one choice, to win or to win. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, President Merzouki, for a, a sobering um, evaluation of the situation in Tunisia and, and in the Arab world. Um, we're going to open the floor to your questions and, and comments, uh, as well as to anybody who is with us on Zoom. He can also send us questions. But I'd like to start with one question that is very um, um, deep in my, in my mind, is uh, how do we rebuild unity uh, between the opposition? Uh, in Tunisia or in the Arab world, and how do we rebuild the trust between uh, Islamists and secularists? We know that Ben Ali fell when the opposition became united. 
um, after the 18th of October movement and after they met for several years and agreed on a platform and agreed on a vision uh, for Tunisia, uh, the, the people moved and, and Ben Ali ran away. Uh, so how can we get uh, back to the, to the unity of the opposition despite their differences? I mean, they can't, be, uh, they can't agree on everything. Obviously, there will still be disagreements on many things. But if they don't come together, I don't think that uh, there is any hope. If they, if they are not united, then the dictatorship will last uh, a lot longer and the price will be a lot heavier. So that's my question. Do you have any ideas, any suggestions on how we can overcome uh, you know, the, the, uh, the mistrust uh, that exists uh, today? Uh, yeah. Well, you know, it's, um, it's the problem everywhere. I know a lot about the Egyptian opposition, the Egyptian, uh, the Syrian opposition, the Yemeni opposition, and it's, it, uh, it's exactly the same problem everywhere, you know. There is a, a lot of opinion, uh, and uh, I really think that uh, hoping that we are reaching a kind of unity where you have a, a national front against dictatorship in Syria, etc. This is what we worked for for more than 10 years, and we, we, we failed. We have to accept that this, we, we failed. Why? Because behind the scene you have uh, foreign actors, behind the scene you have differences of uh, 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 opinion, we have uh, uh, different ambitions, etc. Et so, Useless, you know, to say, uh, well, we, are, we, we will unite and then everything will be okay. We are not going to, 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 have a, a, to build a real front against dictatorship in Tunisia. What we can have is <clears throat> a kind of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, that Jabhat al-Khalas, what we call Jabhat al-Khalas, is uh, the front, this is the most important political uh, organization against dictatorship. You have another, you have uh, uh, my party, you know, which is a secularist party. And uh, you have uh, another also secularist party, Qalb uh, Tunis. Mm -hmm. And you have also a small Islamist group named Al uh, Karama. So this front, we have two secularist party and two Islamist party. But uh, at the same time, you have also all the secularist party, five secularist parties saying, we are not going to do anything. Uh, if another is in the, in the game, another has to, to give up and another has to, you know, to, to go away, to leave the, 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 the political field. Otherwise, we are not going to do anything with you. And uh, for me, it's not acceptable because another is part of the political game. It has to be accepted and exactly the same thing. In Egypt, you cannot get rid of one part of the population. While I have a lot of reproach against another, I know that another you know, played an important role in this bad reputation it has for, for the moment, but you have to make the distinction between you know, a, a political position that you can have, you can uh, have, a good, you have discussion or have, uh, different point of view with another, and the other point which is, no, I'm not going to work with an Islamist group, whatever happened. But we are in this, you know, in, in this contradiction, on this problem. I, I do hope that we are going to solve it because, the, because of dictatorship. Because dictatorship is no is uh, uh, harassing everybody, is uh, uh, you know, repressing everybody, and maybe because, or I would say, thanks to the dictatorship, we will <laughs> we will have we will have this political front. But for the moment, it's a problem, and. Uh, I don't have to, to, to lie to you. It's a difficult problem. Okay. So we'll yeah. take uh, three questions at a time. Uh, Dr. Marzouk, if you can write down mm. the, the question. And please introduce yourself. We have a microphone. We'll, we'll start with, uh, okay, Khalil and then Ricky and then you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Radwan. Thank you, Dr. Marzouki. Uh, thank you for your dedication and for your role over the last 50 years in fighting for democracy and human rights. Really appreciate that. Can you introduce yourself, please? Myself, and, and can uh, my you stand up? Okay. Because we have my name is Khalil Anan. I'm a senior fellow at the Arab Center, Washington, D.C. So my question to you is, what happened to the Tunisian civil society? To the civil society in Tunisia. This civil society played a very important role in the uprising in Tunisia 2011, particularly mm -hmm. Tahad al-Amal al-Shughul. I'm so disappointed in their 
position after the coup of Qais Ali last year. They did almost nothing to stop the coup of Qais Ali. And to some extent, I feel that they are uh, with them, unfortunately, despite the fact they played a very important role against Ben Ali for 30 years. What happened to them? What is the Tunisian street? We don't see uh, that resistance within the street against Qais Ali. Shara Tunisi. Should I ask in Arabic? Maybe much? No, no, it's okay. Just okay. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Khalil. Uh, Ricky? Okay. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Ricky Goldstein, Human Rights Watch. Um, uh, following on the preceding question about civil society, I accept your analysis, Dr. Marzuki, as far as it goes, but you don't talk, uh, you don't really uh, talk about the role of the Tunisian people. And by that I mean, for 16 months now, President Saeed has been dismantling democracy. And there's been largely a demobilization of the people. There hasn't been a uh, mobilization to restore democratic institutions or, or widespread protests. And this is not the Egypt of uh, Abdel Fattah Sisi. He did not uh, round up 20,000 Muslim Brotherhood members. It's not a state of terror. Yes, there are violations. It's a scary situation, but it is not the terror of okay. Egypt. Yeah. Why is it that you can, it's easy to say it's the economy, but there's no magic solution for the economy. I think there's a greater danger or greater possibility of a military coup in Tunisia when Said fails than there is of a restoration of democracy. And I'm, it's not just an, a sterile question I'm asking, because I think it goes to why Western governments are not um, mobilizing to put pressure on Said, because there doesn't seem to be a, a surge of popular sentiment for democ de democracy in Tunisia. And it's, it's an excuse that um, Western governments are hiding behind. Thank you. Yeah, How do you persuade people that uh, the, a dem democratic solution is what's most needed when the economy has no signs of turning around quickly? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good morning. Um, this is Dr. Gassam Boudia from Demokratia Center. Mr. President, we're so glad that you're safe here in the land of liberty, but we're very sad that the Tunisian people are facing what they're facing right now. Um, I have like a couple of quick questions that uh, can be easily answered. Um, you said that uh, you don't know President Said. You know that President Said will not talk to you at all. Like, can we know who does he talk to? Does like. Usually it's known that he doesn't talk to anybody. Um, <laughs> this is number one. But he um, talks to himself. Well, uh, I mean, he, uh, uh, Professor Marzou might know, might know something about that. Um, concerning um, what steps need to be undone of what uh, President Saeed has did, like the Constitution, the incoming elections, I don't know. Well, what, it, what should be undone? Um, number three, Le uh, Sommet Francophone, that was, uh, was it the stage of salvation for, for uh, uh, Kais Saeed um, and the same as uh, President Sisi's uh, summit in Sherm Sheikh, the climate summit, was that the stage of salvation for these uh, two guys or it's just like a numbing or, you know, what do we say, uh, an aesthetic needle? Um, and then the volcano's eruption is coming. Mm -hmm. um, that's the question. And one last question. Um, why don't you deal, work with um, civil society activists and, you know, democratic parties act, actors like Habir Musi and others in Tunisia? What bans this collaboration to create, you know, a certain coalition in order to let democracy rule? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you can yeah, answer yeah, these uh, three uh, questions. The, the, uh, no, no, it's too much. Uh, 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 you have to react very quickly about Abir Musa. You know, Abir Musa and all this kind of people, they just want... Uh, uh, Abir Musi and all this kind of people, they were just one thing, you know, to come back to the, 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 the prior situation of uh, uh, to, to have their own dictatorship. So how can you deal with people, you know, their objective is, you know, to, to, to go back to the system, to the same political system that the Tunisian people revolt against. 
Um, what about the salvation? Uh, I think it's for CC, like for uh, uh, Said. They think, they hope that um, this kind of summit would help them to restore their image uh, internationally, etc., etc. But in fact, the fate would be uh, mainly the responsibility of the people. So I don't think that uh, this would be any, any, any help to solve the social and economic problem they are struggling against. So I don't think really that is extremely important or that matter for, for, the, for, for the people. For the, the question about, uh, uh, do we know that, uh, about Kaisaid. Kaisaid is the man uh, unable to talk to anybody else than, than himself, you know. So he, he wrote the Constitution himself, you know. Even the people working with him uh, resigned. He decided everything. He's really the, the, the kind of guy that thinking that the, the but this is, the, this is the, the, the ideology of the populist, uh, all the populists. For the populists, what's happened is you have the leader, and the inspired leaders, something like a prophet, and then you have the people. And in between, you cannot rely on any kind of uh, uh, set of rule or institution, etc. This is the relationship between the people, it's something, it's a, it's, a, it's a magical way of thinking, you know. It's a very old, primitive way of thinking. This is what, uh, what's the main characteristic of, of the, the, uh, the, the populism ideology. The, 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 the leader, he was a kind of prophet, and this is why I think it's, you have to be a little bit crazy. And I think really he's insane. I, my, it's my deep conviction as, as a doctor that he is, he has a kind of psychosis. This is my, you know, I never, I never use this kind of term against uh, Bergerkai, Sipsi, or against any kind of, uh, but I, or Ben Ali. But I, I deeply believe, and this is why I'm extremely uh, upset for my country that to be led by somebody who's insane. He really believed that he's a kind of prophet, you know, and here the people, the people, the ten percent of the Tunisian people, you know, voted for the for, for the, the the last. Uh, but he's still talking about the people. That he's the people. He's the soul of the people. And the people has to be led by a kind of leader. It's completely crazy. And this is why it's much more dangerous for, for us, probably than in uh, dangerous and maybe more fragile than in the Sisi, because a, a Sisi, even a Sisi, you know, he's I would say he's not insane. He's uh, He's a stupid, he's as you, you want, as you, but he, he knows exactly what he's doing. This guy is completely out of this. So he's not going to talk to anybody, and this is why I don't expect any kind of political solution with him until there is a coup, a military coup, and that's I am afraid of, or there is, a, you know, kind of chaos in the, in, the, in, the, in the country, and this also is not uh, um, uh, something that we wish. So about uh, uh, civil you, uh, the civil society, both you have asked about civil society. Tunisia is it to have, you know, why Tunisia uh, didn't know the fate of Yemen, of Syria, and of, uh, you know, of Libya. It's not because we are smarter or me, more, most peaceful people, etc. It's it, because the very structure of our society, we are homogeneous society, middle class society, western class society, etc. And we use it to have, very strong civil society uh, uh, NGOs under the dictatorship, which didn't w w was the case uh, uh, in Libya, for instance, where they didn't have at all uh, civil society movement. So we, we use it to have a uh, very strong so, uh, civil society movement. I was part of this civil society movement before, you know, going uh, in politics. And I know that the civil society played an important role. Human rights leagues, the, the, you know, uh, women uh, NGOs, uh, democrat, etc. It was a huge movement. It was very important. But for the moment, now, now uh, currently, I'm afraid to say that we are, of course, uh, we, we still have uh, an important and uh, strong NGOs working in the field. But we also have a lot of corrupt, you know, because after the, after the, the revolution, uh, the, the democracy you led, uh, was the occasion for everybody, you know, to, to build any kind of political party, everybody to have in NGOs, etc. So we have had a lot of corrupt NGOs uh, uh, organization, and we are suffering for the moment from uh, those NGOs. I'll give you just one example. Uh, you, you have a lot of NGOs who have supported the coup, and you, all these NGOs, mainly are supposed to support democracy, but they didn't support democracy, they support the coup. And 
A lot of those NGOs are funded by uh, here, the, uh, NED or uh, I don't know many other, uh, uh, yes, funded by, you know. So imagine you, you are funding uh, NGOs to promote democracy and then suddenly you discover that those NGOs are supporting the coup. This is a problem and this is probably uh, here in, in Washington you have to, you know, to take this in account and to review all your policy about uh, supporting any, any, any kind of uh, NGOs, just saying, look, I am uh, working in, this, so, uh, yeah, in the field of civil society, etc. Unfortunately, we have in Tunisia a lot of corruption in media political parties and civil society. Corruption is everywhere. This is why I think uh, it's very important for, for, for us now to, to, to tackle this problem because it is the problem everywhere. It used to be the problem of the government, of the dictatorship for the moment. For the moment, it's the problem of, uh, the, of the, the, the state, the civil society, the political parts. And this is why the transition is, is a little bit complex because the people supposed to, to be the leading the, the transition uh, themselves, you know, uh, not, I'm not sure that they are real Democrats. What was it, the last? Uh, Where is the street? Uh, yes, what is the street? Look, uh, I'm sorry to, to know that we, well, when we talk about the revolution uh, in, 2000, in 2011, uh, we, we say that the Egyptian people, no, it was not the Egyptian people. It was 100,000 people, you know, who were in the Tahrir Square and who participated to the, to, the, to the revolution. It's exactly the same thing in Tunisia. No, that it was not the whole Tunisian people. It was just part, you know, a tiny part of the Tunisian people who took to the street. So expecting that now uh, we, we are, you should have all the Tunisian people, you know, taking to the street protest against, uh, against the dictator, I think it's, it's, it's well, it's, it's, it's a myth. But consider what happened during the last, uh, the last 12 months in Tunisia. You would see that you have a lot of demonstration, a lot of the rallies, many, 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 many of them, and with sometimes with, with 10,000 people, which is ex extremely, you know, extremely important in Tunisia. So in fact, the Tunisian people reacted against the, the, the coup, and we are still reacting, we are still working on it. So uh, saying that uh, the, the Tunisian people is accepting the, dictator, the dictatorship, maybe that was true in, in the very, very beginning. One of, one of the reasons is that really the Tunisian people was hating, you know, the Nahda, were hating the parliament because of the bad image the parliament gave, etc., et, cetera, et cetera. So, so the people felt relieved and they thought that something else would be uh, uh, that situation, that economic situation would improve the situa political situation of the country would improve, etc. And what they are saying, this is what I told you, that fortunately the Tunisians are, are watching very carefully what's, what's the kind of alternative they have to the democratic system. Of course the democratic system with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, mistakes, etc., etc. But now they can compare the, between the democratic system, even if it was, you know, with all its problem, all the difficulty, and then they compare what's, what's the reality of, uh, uh, of a populist state. They see the difference, and this is why I, I do believe that something is, you know, uh, changing in the mind and hearts of the uh, uh, population, and this maybe would help us, you know, to have a new opportunity to, to build a democracy, a, a, a real democracy. But then we will have the responsibility, you know, to build a real democracy, you know, to, to tackle the real problem of the, of, the, of the corruption within the political party, the corruption within the civil society, the, the, the electoral court, etc., etc., the corruption in the media. Because if we do not tackle all this problem, we are going once again to have a new failure. So we'll take three more questions. Uh, Mohammed, uh, Anwar. And uh, we'll take one in the back there. But... Father Mohammed. He's, he's coming out the mic. Ah, okay. We'll, we'll start yeah, here. Hello. Yeah, hey, Mohammed. Mohammed Shinlawi, Senior Analyst at The Voice of America. Across the Arab Spring countries, economy is the top priority for the ordinary citizen. The is the Arab population ready for democracy when average person is struggling to earn enough money or enough income to support his or her family? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Anwar. Assalamu alaikum. 
Rais, selamun aleyküm. My name is Anwar Hadam, elected member of Algeria parliament 30 years ago, and still struggling for, the, for democracy in Algeria. Actually, I would like uh, just a few seconds just to maybe we could be inspired by what is going on in Algeria that you didn't mention at all. As you know, we had about two, two years of, of what we call harak. harak. It was two years, uh, minions and minions uh, around the country, not only in one city or two, who were, uh, I mean, on the street, but they were peaceful, and they were civilized uh, revolution, it, uh, really. And that shows that the people are, are, are looking for, for the unity. I would like to go back. I, want, I don't want you to, to escape the, the first question. There is no way. The, the people are looking for unity among various uh, ideological uh, groups with, within the society. It's up to the elite to furnish an effort within the Islamists and within the secularists also. And we have Algeria as experiment. 30 years after the struggle, that has been used by the military in order to topple the, uh, the elections. And uh, we experienced 30 years of, you know, people, that, they don't want to go back to, to, to there. So I think we need to struggle. We need to find a solution. We need to have a new national contract. Yeah. That's what sure. uh, I think. Sure. Thank, Thank you yes. very much. Yes, in the back over there. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, first thing, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mustafa Marzuki for coming here and enlightening us with this. Can you introduce beautiful... yourself, please? And uh, I'm Radwan Mazghani. I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Maryland College Park. Um, from Tunisia. From, yeah, from Sfat <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, The first thing I wanted to say is that in some way I feel like I represent at least a little bit the, the youth of Tunisia, um, I feel like uh, there is definitely some uh, disaffection with the democratic process. Uh, just some facts, between 2014 and 2019, which is the time after the, uh, the, the, the constitution until the time of Qais Saeed, uh, Tunisia actually had GDP decline. So the first thing is that the, this process had like adverse impacts on on the economic status of the Tunisian people. And obviously we know that GDP is oftentimes a good marker on uh, like the general wealth uh, of the population. The second thing is that we've seen that in the current political parties, in the current political landscape, especially the parties that make up Jabhat al-Khalas, we find that they were not maybe so true to their values. For example, the, the parties failed to retrieve the money that was stolen by the Bin Ali and their family abroad. Second thing, we saw Qanun al-Tasalih, uh, Al Idari, uh, in 2000, that was uh, head by Al Bajika Al Sipsi, but also in Nahda was in power. The third, probably biggest event, was the fact that the Nahda government took down the government, or Nahda took down the government of Elias Al Fakhfakh over uh, accusations of uh, of of uh, al masarif al like um, I don't know how to say this name, Con conflict, uh, conflict of interest. But in the end, after that, decided to form a government with Qalb Tunis, whose, whose leader, Nabil, uh, Nabil Qarwi, is known to be corrupt. He has a corruption case. So how do we go from here when, when we, as a Tunisian youth, have zero trust in the current parties that are in power, whether they be Islamist, secularist, or whatever? Uh, and, ha and how can we find that in Jabhat al-Khalas and these kind of personalities that we've seen for the past 10 years, how can they be form the real leadership and the real uh, kind of uh, opposition to the current dictatorship? Thank you. Thank you very much. What about the first question, the question of economy? Of course, uh, people took to the street for two reasons, for ma two major reasons everywhere, for political freedom and for social justice, mainly for social justice and improvement of their uh, status, of the, you know, the economic status. That was obvious. And I can say that uh, for the first, uh, the first objective, we succeeded because Tunisia under my presidency was a free country and people enjoyed their political freedom, the freedom of association, freedom of, etc., etc. I never sent any 
uh, any journalists in prison, while well, for the moment you know, a lot of them in prison, etc. So I can say that the, the first objective you know, of the, the revolution has been achieved. The second was not. We, we didn't deliver. We didn't deliver for many reasons. The economy, we didn't deliver for, for many reasons. First, we have inherited a, a, a corrupt and inefficient and unjust economy. This is why people took to, to the street. So we inherited all this economy. This is the first, first question, the, the first reason we, we didn't deliver. And the second reason we didn't deliver the growth, etc., what the people was expecting, is the political instability. Because during the time I was president, I had three, three government. And then after me, there are three other government. And, and for the moment, Tunisia has about 10 government in 10 years. So political instability, you know that under, when you have political stability, you cannot have uh, economic growth. Foreign investor, internal investor, etc., cetera, would, would, not, would not be interested in investing, saying, hey, uh, let's wait, then we will see what would happen, etc., etc. So we didn't deliver the first because we have inherited of this economy, the second because of the polit uh, political instability, third because the, the, the another side effect of the political instability is the fact that Tunisia is a tourist country. We used to have five million tourists every year. When you have this political instability, people would not come. So that means that you have you add to the, the, the jobless people, you add 2,000, 200,000 people without jobs because of, you know, the crash of tourism. So there was a lot of... And, the other reason is the fact that the, the, the deep state, you know, did everything to block all our reform. I can assure you that we, we, we made a lot of effort, you know, to promote investment using the money of the state, you know, to invest in the hinterland. But the hinterland, we, 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 I have discovered that the, the government and a lot of people, you know, were trying, you know, to, uh, you know, to stop anything because this would benefit for myself, for the benefits to the now the government, etc., etc. So we have a lot of reason, and then the other reason is that we have asked the our Western friend, hey, the, the, our main problem is debt. Could you relieve us of debt? They said no. We said, look, we have a lot of money, you know, in your bank stolen by the by, by the dictatorship. Can we recover it? They said no. We have to go to courts, etc., etc. So you have a lot of reasons that we couldn't deliver uh, economically. And this is why the counter revolution, you know, come to power democratically in Tunisia because they have used the fact that we didn't deliver. But, but, now the counter revolution is in charge of the country for more than, uh, than five years or even six years. They didn't deliver either. They didn't deliver either. The economy is worsening day after day because of the, because corruption is back because they are inefficient, because, because a lot of it, so they didn't deliver. So the population is now facing a situation where they have lost their freedoms and they didn't gain anything economically. This is the situation. This is why it's going to, to, to explode. This is why it's going to burst. So, yes, of course, we, 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 we didn't succeed for many, many reasons, internal reasons. Some of our, our main responsibility, some are not our main responsibility of the country revolution, the responsibility of foreign actors, etc., etc. We couldn't deliver. But once again, the, the country revolution did. Look at the situation in, in, uh, in Egypt. You know, you have the state is about, you know, on the verge of bankruptcy. So, once again, because they didn't deliver economically, they took all the, the freedom brought by the revolution. You are going to have a new volcano. The, 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 that's I am quite absolutely sure. Now, what was the other question? Uh, yes, Algeria. Yeah, Algeria. Well, I didn't talk about Algeria because I have I have always a very very difficult problem with Algerian government, and with Algeria. Uh, the, the, you know, they were very scared. The Algerians were extremely scared about the, the, the Tunisian re revolution. And I have a lot of meeting with, the, 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 you know, Bouteflika at the time, uh, uh, the, all the leaders, uh, Oyahya, et cetera, et cetera. And I saw that they were very reluctant to talk with me. And uh, I saw that they were very, um, not only because they were, I'm supposed to be close to Morocco, which is not true, but they were very, very much afraid of, uh, of the Tunisian uh, revolution. And I think they were right. They were right. Because the Hirak, what is the Hirak? The Iraq, uh, like what happened in Iran now, is something like the echo of what happened in Tunisia. It's, and why is it the, the echo of what's happened in Tunisia? Because in all this country, we have the same problem. You have corrupt elite, brutal elite, you know, governing people of, of uh, not of citizens, but the people of subjects, 
And of course they were afraid to see that the example of Tunisia could be uh, an example for them. And they were right. The Iranians were right, you know, to be scared, and the Algerian government were, were right to be scared. And what happened now in Iran and in the Iraq is exactly this, what, the same thing what happened. It failed in Algeria for, for uh, I failed for the, I think, here, all Algeria is, is the beginning of the beginning of the beginning. And it's now, you know, what's happening in Iran. The Iranian people is fighting, and I think the process is now ongoing, and it won't stop. So uh, now you talk about the fact that uh, the, we had to, uh, you know, to unite, etc. I'm, I totally agree with you. The, I'm working all the... I wouldn't say 24-7, uh, but I, I can assure you that I'm working on all that. But you, you have to accept that the, the problem is not that easy. It takes time, and you are not probably going to have everybody on board. Maybe if you can have as, as many uh, uh, political actors as possible working together, uh, that will be uh, enough. But uh, imagining that you will have everybody on board and united, etc., this is a myth. I, as, as political actor, I can assure you that we we'll never reach. And we are, maybe we can lose a lot of time and a lot of energy on trying to, to solve this problem. I prefer that my energy goes to, the, you know, to working on the field well, rather than having uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, hours you know, talking and talking to talking with people who never accept to, you know, to work with you. The last question was about how can uh, ah, yes. the people have trust again in the, in the political parties and look, in democracy? Look, I, I, I want, to, want to be frank with you. I don't accept this kind of thing. You don't trust me? How, how, how would I trust you? W what have you done for the country? This is what I always say to the Tunisian when I go, you know, on the battlefield. They say, yeah, you didn't do it. I said, look, I'm not, uh, I am not your servant. I am one citizen among you. You have to work with me. We have to work together. If you don't want to get, I am not here at your service. I am just one of one like you, and we have to work together to, to solve the country. You, you, you don't have to, to, to talk to me as your, you know, as your servant. This mentality of consumer, you know, they are waiting you to deliver. Uh, uh, you have to bring them democracy. You have to bring them the everything. You have to, and they have just, you know, to look at you and say, I am going to trust you. I am not going to trust. No. Uh, Give me a reason now to trust the youth now leaving the country because they are not able, you know, to fight inside the country for, for their country. So, do you understand what I mean? It's, it's not up to you to, take, to, to talk to me to say, give me the reason to, be, to trust you. Why should I give you any reason to, to trust me? I have been on the fight for more than five decades and you what have you done for your country. This is what I'm telling, frankly, to the, everybody, every young people t talking this way. No, I'm not, I don't accept this way of, t of talking. You have to talk to me respectfully, and you have to accept that it's also your job to, to fight for the country. It's not only mine. And you, ha you, must have, you must give me a reason to trust you. You must fight on the field so I can trust you. And then you can have, or uh, ask me how can I trust you. Excuse me, but this is the way I am talking in Tunisia. It's not the way I'm talking to you now here in Washington. We're, we're out of time, but we're going to take maybe two or three very quick questions because Mr. Marzouki has another uh, uh, meeting, so we, ha we have to leave in about five minutes. Please, uh, if you have an urgent question and a short question. Uh, well, in fact, I, no, no, I would like to have no question. Comment. You, what, what, you, okay. what do you advise me to do? <laughs> this, because I want to hear from you. As I know my narrative. I know my... But I want to have... To look. What do you think about what is happening? What do you suggest me? What, do you, what, do you want, what would you advise me? Okay, so we have one, two, three. Okay. One minute each, please. <laughs> Okay, shukran. <laughs> uh, Munji Dawadi, I'm the president of Tunisian United Network. It is a Tunisian organization, and, I, and I'm glad we have some new faces in here. So we hope that we can. Uh, my, my, actually, I was going, I'm thinking about how to uh, phrase my comment into a question, but then you said, give me a comment. My comment is that I think by you, for example, teaching here in the U.S., I think we have an opportunity maybe to create a dialogue. And through a dialogue where we can at least recommit ourselves to democracy, we can address the issue of trust. Yes, there is a broken trust, especially from the youth talking about different political parties. But I think even the U.S. 
even the establishment, even the big think tanks and NGOs, especially those who have offices in Tunisia. For years, they invested in, in an elite, and they created a group of people that were not democratic. I mean, they spent millions of dollars spending on, on people that they thought that they are, you know, building democratic institutions. Instead, they created what I call a, an, an unofficial lobby. They lobbied the U.S. They lobbied the European Union to, to, to save and keep Qaisaia doing what he's doing while he's destroying democracy. I mean, you can go back and look at the, at the, at the uh, Twitter accounts. You can go back and look at the articles that were written, the attacks on anybody who said Qaisaia was, you know, destroying democracy. They were attacking them. They were defending Qaisaia. And all of them, I mean, almost all of them were paid by U.S. tax money and European money. So I think we need, all of us need to review and sit down and, and, and reestablish a conversation that's built on true value of democracy that we can all stand and defend. I totally agree. This is why I said be careful because we have a lot of corruption in the civil society in Tunisia everywhere. You have to be very, to watch this problem very carefully and to be very, very... I was really very shocked to see a lot of our organization backing the coup, and this is uh, one, one of the reasons that I think that the process would be much more complex and long than, be, than expected. Thank you. One, quickly, please. Hi, my name is Shafiq al Gumai, and I'm a peace. Please, I don't Yemeni, have Yemeni peace, uh, congratulations for, uh, Yemen, for Yemen and democratization, of course. <laughs> How. Uh, I thank you, uh, President Marzouki. I follow you all the time. Uh, how we can uh, rebuild, rebuild uh, uh, our uh, our uh, people to uh, to also come and, and defend democracy? That the, the new uh, educated people, the, the educated people, we have a lot of educated people in the whole world, the Arab world, and they are enlightened, enlightened, and they are, some of them are rich, and they are willing also to create even, uh, even media, democracy, the media for uh, uh, educating for democracy in the Arab world. We need that, and we need to create that. We need to do coalition together. Uh, otherwise, we need to, you know, to, to educate people. Otherwise, we cannot do it uh, and, and leave it as you said. It will take years and years to, to be done. Thank no, you. Thank we you. have to do it because we have to make sure that they understand what the what the dictatorship in the Arab world are doing to the people. They are killing people. Thank you. Thank you. One last question, quickly. Uh, uh, comment, please. comment. Or comment, yeah. There is a component that I would Mike. want to ask you about. The military, how was it during your three years? And we will, will we ever see a Suwar Dahab in our militaries? <laughs> Thank you. It's, um, yes, it's very, very difficult question. I can assure you that during my presidency, I changed the, all the military data. I'm sure I changed the, the very, very quickly because I was afraid that we could, ha we could have a coup like in Egypt. Unfortunately, the military was behind the legal and, uh, uh, you know, disciplined uh, uh, military in Tunisia. But I don't know for the moment what's happening because I believe that uh, this guy is still in power because he's backed by the military. But what kind of military will, are they waiting just for the moment that uh, this guy is become so unpopular that they can be sure that removing him wouldn't wouldn't change? But what I don't want is, you know, to have a, coup, a military coup like in, uh, like in Egypt, because what I would like the military to do is to, to give up, the, 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 to, to go back to the constitution of uh, the revolution and to stay away uh, of, of, the, of the political process. But once again, I don't know. We have to, to wait and to pray. Look, in, in our Arab states, you have two kinds of Arab states. You have the states who have who own a military, and you have the other kind of military war owning states. For instance, Algeria. Algeria is you know, the military having a state. You know, Israel is a military having a state. Egypt is a military having a state. In Tunisia, 
We still, we still, I hope that a state, a state having a military, but we don't know. We don't know. Well, thank you all very much. I really appreciate your uh, patience and your uh, attendance. Uh, thank you, Dr. Marzouki, for uh, joining us today. Thank you.